You're listening to Somewhere in the Middle. It's a song about a child thanking his parents for adopting him from a country ravaged by war, Vietnam. If you can only see the world through my eyes. The artist is Jared Rayburg. Carry all the weight of one race in my disguise. It's one of many songs that Jared performs in homage to his family and his heritage. And I'm reminded that I'm different every time I see my name. I'm somewhere in the middle, I'm somewhere in between. And I hope I made you proud for just being me. I can't. Change my past or who I'm supposed to be. I'm adopted by destiny and loved by you. This episode of DIA Connections is about integrity, duty, selfless service, excellence, and above all, opportunity. It's about people who gave all so others could have the opportunity for a new life. And it's about people who made the most with that opportunity. This is DIA Connections. We rode through the streets of Saigon. There were desperate scenes with families separated and crying out for help, pleading not to be left behind, clutching at the last straw of hope. The fact that a C5 was there, that it was empty, and that it was going to be used for baby lift posed a marvelous opportunity if you were in the people trafficking business, which by then, most of us were. They said, well, we want you to go in and take out as many people as you can. How many can you take? We estimated that we could probably take out a thousand people. We came back in and they said, oh, by the way, it's going to be children. I knew we were gonna have a crash landing and I thought, I am gonna live through this to tell this story. And that was just weird because it was like, a sudden intuition or knowledge that this plane is gonna crash and I am gonna to live to tell. The most important part of, the, of this whole thing obviously isn't me. It's um, the people that passed away and that gave their lives to help a humanitarian effort. Whatever happened politically, that wasn't us. We were just children and babies. Glad you could join us for the story of an amazing rescue effort. This is Operation Babylift Tragedy and triumph. You're listening again to music from Jared Rayburg. Jared was one of thousands of orphan children that were airlifted from Vietnam and adopted by families around the world in one of the largest aerial evacuations in history. Operation Babylift enabled me to live my life to the fullest. We'll hear more about Jared's life and music later. But first, let's talk about the combined effort of the United States, Canada, Australia, and France to mass evacuate more than 3,000 refugees from South Vietnam. And we'll learn about the Defense Intelligence Agency's connection with that historic mission. On April 30th, 1975, the South Vietnamese capital of Saigon fell to the North Vietnamese Army. With the panache of a general pattern, the first North Vietnamese tank swept into Saigon. The last will and testament of Ho Chi Minh was being fulfilled. In the weeks leading up to that day, the situation on the ground in South Vietnam was rapidly deteriorating. The crowds of Americans and other foreigners lined up at installations around Saigon waiting for buses was the huge. It told the Vietnamese that this was the end of the line. For most of those who wanted to leave their country, this would be their last chance. Some Americans Throughout March and April of 1975, the North Vietnamese Army captured more and more southern cities. Citizens began to flee in mass numbers any way they could, no matter the danger. There's a sea of humanity jamming on. We're pulling them on as fast as we can. We're pulling away. We're leaving them behind. We're pulling up. 
That report inside a plane at the Da Nang airport. South Vietnamese soldiers. Time was of the essence for those trying to leave, which appeared to be almost everyone. The plight of the country's war orphans surged to the forefront of American consciousness, which included the President of the United States, Gerald Ford. We are seeing a great human tragedy as untold numbers of Vietnamese flee the North Vietnamese onslaught. The United States has been doing and will continue to do its utmost to assist these people. I have directed that all available naval ships... The most vulnerable victims of the war were the children, children of ordinary citizens, of South Vietnamese loyalists working with the U.S. government, and of American soldiers. U.S. officials believed that these mixed-race children faced a life of hardship and possible death because they were physically associated with the American military presence. They needed to be saved, and President Ford provided a lifeline. These 2,000 Vietnamese orphans are all in the process of being adopted by American families. This is the least we can do, and we will do much, much more. The planning and executing of the evacuation mission was organized from the Defense Attaché Office, the DAO, at the U.S. Embassy compound at Tun Son Yut Airport in Saigon. The reins for the monumental task were handed to career logistician Major General Homer Smith. He was the DIA Defense Attaché and the senior military officer in the country. They couldn't have made a better choice. Retired Army Colonel Stuart Harrington was an intelligence officer based in Saigon from 1973 to 1975. He was there on a noble mission of his own. I was a part of the negotiations and of the uh, continuing obligation that the U.S. government felt for um, obtaining information on the missing and the dead during the whole conflict. Colonel Harrington was one of the 50 military personnel and 1,200 civilian employees working out of the DAO. He had a unique vantage point of General Smith's techniques and observed how he facilitated safe passage for thousands. Smith basically was the key man. Smith said, we want to play by the rules to the max extent possible. We don't want to run afoul the embassy by running an underground railroad, by high profile this or high profile that, which will uh, just complicate things. For most Americans, the Vietnam War ended in 1973 with the signing of the Paris Peace Accords. That's when U.S. troops began withdrawing from Vietnam. But one of the provisions of the agreement was that the U.S. could replace military materiel that was destroyed during the ceasefire to support South Vietnamese forces. That created a unique opportunity. Big cargo planes bringing weapons into the country and people needing to get out of the country. The fact that a C-5 was there, that it was empty, and that it was going to be used for baby lift, posed a marvelous opportunity if you were in the people trafficking business, which by then, most of us were. With General Smith's support, the Defense Attaché Office staff cajoled, bribed, begged, and hoodwinked to evacuate the South Vietnamese personnel who had worked with the Americans and the remaining U.S. citizens and their Vietnamese families. And it was clear from uh, from General Smith that he was in a uh, look-the-other-way mode as long as we didn't do stupid things. By the end of April, Smith and his staff at the Defense Attaché Office had processed more than 40,000 evacuees, including 3,000 orphans, a feat for which the General was awarded the Distinguished Service Medal. What General Smith and his team accomplished was extraordinary, especially when you take into account what occurred the very first day Operation Babylift went into effect. A day that Smith described as, quote, the longest day of my life, a shattering, shattering experience. Good evening. In South Vietnam today, a ghastly chapter was added to the pathos of war that has gripped that country for the past 30 years. A huge C-5 Air Force cargo plane carrying 243 South Vietnamese orphans to the United States, the first in the government-ordered airlift, crashed in a rice paddy near Saigon just minutes after takeoff. It was a shocking and catastrophic start to the mission. 
138 people died in the crash, including 78 orphans and 35 civilian employees from the Defense Attaché Office. Five of those were from the Defense Intelligence Agency. They were Celeste Brown, Vivian Clark, Dorothy Curtis, Joan Prey, and Doris Watkins. Miraculously, 178 people survived the crash, thanks in large part to what was described as a remarkable demonstration of flying skill by the pilot Captain Dennis Trainer. Captain Trainer, or Bud, as he prefers to be called, was one of the survivors. He joined us for a conversation about his mission and that horrific day. Bud, thank you so much for joining us. Before we talk about what happened on that flight, I want to begin by asking you to lead us up to the events prior to that day. Where were you when you first found out about the mission? During the Vietnam War, uh, I was a captain in the Air Force and uh, lived at Travis Air Force Base in California. I headed for Hawaii, Hickam Air Force Base, and went into crew rest. In the meantime, an airplane had come through Travis uh, carrying a load of howitzers. So when I woke up at in, in Hawaii, they told me I would be taking a load of howitzers uh, toward Vietnam. My understanding is there, there were 17 howitzers on that plane. Clearly an enormous aircraft. For those unfamiliar, can you describe how big the C-5 Galaxy Transport is? The C-5 is uh, a very large airplane. In fact, you put other airplanes inside of it. You could load it up. It's, it's really huge. Even the flight deck is 33 feet in the air. So you're in Hawaii, and you receive a call from back in the States with more information about your mission. Tell us about that. When I got to the phone and started talking to them, they said things like, well, how many how many people can you take on your airplane? And I said, well, I've got 73 seats upstairs. And they said, no, no, no. How many can you really take? So I took my loadmaster out, and we literally heel-toed between tie-down rings and that sort of thing, and we estimated that we could probably take out a 1,000 people. We came back in, and they said, oh, by the way, it's going to be children. Then they asked me, well, what, what do you need? So I was pretty versed in what kids needed. So the next thing we did was told them we needed pampers and juices and milks and blankets and all the things that I knew, the standard operating equipment for young kids. So they said, well, what else do you need? Would you like a, a medical team? And I said, sure. I remember Bud saying to me, well, hi, I'm Bud Trainer. I've never flown an air evac mission in my life. He said, so what do I have to do? I said, basically, you fly the plane, we'll take care of everybody in the plane. That's Regina Auni, and she was also on that first official flight as the medical crew director. Her account of that day is nothing short of breathtaking. Here she is with DIA chief historian Paul Isaacson. So let me start by asking you uh, to give us a sense of your background and your duties at that time. I was a flight nurse assigned to the 10th Aeromedical Evacuation Squadron at Travis Air Force Base in Fairfield, California. I had less than a year's flying experience. Um, most of us were new at flight nursing. So, Regina, when did you exactly find out that you were going to be a part of this mission? After we offloaded the cargo, the aircraft commander, Bud Trainer, asked us to come up to the flight deck while he and the co-pilot went in to the command post to, to find out what our mission was because we still didn't know totally what our mission was. And when he came back with an Air Force colonel who, who said, who is the medical crew director on this mission? And I said, I am, sir. And he said, well, your mission is to take 300 people out of Vietnam, most of them children under the age of two. What was your reaction when you first heard that you were going to be taking a large load of babies out? You want me, a first lieutenant who's got nine months flying experience, to figure this all out and take care of it. Uh, totally overwhelmed. But at the same time, again, and it goes back to the flight training we got. It's like, okay, I have to figure out what I've got to do. I don't have time to worry about how I feel about all this. And, and I knew the flight crew was augmented, so I said to Bud, I said, okay, give me your 
augmented flight crew. They need to be part of my crew now. They need to help me because that would give us 10 people instead of five. In the military, when you face a situation like this, you have to improvise, adapt, and overcome. I mean, that's just it. Failure is not an option. When the C-5 landed on April 4th, 1975, at the Tun Sun Yat Air Base, ground crews quickly unloaded the howitzers and readied the aircraft for the children. The crew removed the armrests from the 73 airline seats in the upstairs troop compartment and put the children two in a seat, six across. Downstairs, in the cargo compartment, blankets were placed on the floor and tie-down straps normally used to secure heavy equipment were used to secure the children. Google Operation Babylift when you have a chance. You'll see some amazing photos of what this looked like. It's really a profound visual. You're about to listen to the dramatic accounts of the flight from Regina Auni and Captain Trainer. You'll also hear additional sound from the recovered black box. This audio has rarely been heard before now. Yeah, there's the Vietnamese Army here. They're trying to take some of them off. I don't think they're having any luck, though. We got everybody loaded on the airplane and situated. Engines clear to start. Setting number one. We ran the checklists and the people on the ground. We had a lot of activity out there. Uh, I later found out that it was, they were trying to prevent us from leaving. Well, all these people are milling around in the yard bank. Door is closed and we wouldn't have to wait for them later. Load master, do not stop the operation. Do not. People were worried about passports and manifests and, and I kind of just blew them off and we, we took off. Perfectly normal takeoff. So I maintained about a 200 knot climb out. We're going to go across Vung Tau and then proceed from Vung Tau, which is a town on the coast, and, and go direct to uh, the Philippines. So when the plane took off, where were you located on board? I was in the cargo compartment of the aircraft. I was sitting along the side. And as we were taking off, as we were climbing to altitude, one of the women who was accompanying the children got violently ill. So I went upstairs to get the medication that we were going to give her. So... What was the first indication for you that there was something wrong on the plane? It was just a loud explosive noise. All the insulation in the upper part of the aircraft came like clouds of insulation flying about. Sitting up front, from my perspective, I hear a bang. At 23,000 feet, just about 12 minutes out of Saigon, the rear cargo door locks failed leading to the near instantaneous departure of the entire ramp and pressure door system, resulting in rapid decompression. That was the bang. That was also when the black box fell into the sea. The cockpit filled with smoke, and the troop compartment checked in and said uh, that the door was gone, and the, and the people basically were fine. And when I looked down, what I saw was the South China Sea. I got to my maximum descent speed and I started to pull back on the yoke and nothing was happening and nothing was happening, nothing was happening. And I saw all the hydraulic fluid all over what part of the floor of the aircraft I could see. The loadmaster went down and was telling me that the control cables are hanging out the back of the airplane like spaghetti. We were so busy that we didn't even know what the pilot was doing in terms of what he and the co-pilot were doing to try to keep the plane flying level. As I went down, I'm going faster and faster and I'm pulling back on the yoke and then finally the, the airplane started to go back up. Now we go into emergency and safety and 
crash landing preparation. And at that point, I did a procedure that you learn in pilot training in fighters, and that is what they call a vertical recovery. We went through the whole troop compartment and re-secured all the children, made sure they were secure. I was planning a long flight back to Saigon. We went through emergency preparation, designated who was going to do what when we finally stopped after we crash landed. I wasn't worried that I was going to die, that I was going to crash. I was going to manage this. It was just one more thing to manage. I knew we were going to have a crash landing, and, and I knew, and I thought, I am going to live through this to tell this story. And that was just weird because it was like a sudden intuition or knowledge or what that it's like, this plane is going to crash and I am going to live to tell. We got almost back to the, to the runway. We emergency extended the gear, but with the extra drag of the gear, I no longer had enough power, enough throttle authority to keep the nose from going down in a turn. The trouble was, instead of being around 100 miles an hour, we're nearly 300 miles an hour. So when we touched down, it yanked the gear off. I remember feeling the first impact. We hit on one side of the Saigon River because they had been able to get the landing gear down. But then we went airborne immediately. We popped back up in the air and I said, oh, wait, we're going up in the air. And I could see now a river in front of me. And I said, oh, we don't want to go in the river. So I added power again. We skimmed across the water. Then when we hit the next time, that was a violent impact because that's where we sheared off the cargo compartment and we became like a little speedboat. That was when I had said goodbye to my wife. As I'm careening down the aisle, I'm feeling my right foot break in several different places. I remember thinking, what am I going to do when we come to a stop? You know, it's, it's going into that, okay, now how do I take care of everybody if we're sitting here in the, the rice paddies? I came to a stop and I thought, I'm alive. After the second ground impact, the aircraft broke into component parts. The upper deck survived largely intact but the impact crushed the cargo deck. Most of the survivors were on the flight deck or in the troop compartment. Hardly anyone who had been in the cargo compartment lived. It's likely that Regina survived because she was in the upper compartment getting medicine for a sick caregiver. She suffered numerous injuries, but somehow managed to provide care for the surviving passengers immediately after the crash, until she eventually collapsed into the arms of rescuers. In 1927, the Air Force established the Cheney Award. It's presented to an airman for an act of valor, extreme fortitude, or self-sacrifice in a humanitarian interest performed in connection with an aircraft. In 1975, Regina Auni was the first woman ever to receive the honor. While anybody might have done what we did, we did it. And it's a testament to the incredible uh, teamwork and training that the Air Force gives its people. Captain Trainer and his crew had displayed remarkable flying skills and presence of mind under extreme stress. Trainer and his co-pilot Captain Tilford Harp later received Air Force crosses for their actions. Other flight crew members earned the Distinguished Flying Cross. In hindsight, there isn't anything else that I wished we had done differently. There, we just didn't have anything else we could have done. So I'm happy with what the crew did. Captain Trainer also said this. 
Great people in tragic times. 138 people died that day, but 178 survived to live the American dream. The war made no allowances for mourning. Under General Homer Smith's guidance, baby lift flights continued for the rest of the month, bringing orphans to anxious families all over the world to begin a new life. One of those little lives that came to America holds a very special place in our hearts here at the Defense Intelligence Agency. So we'd like to tell you about her. So the story goes that I was left on an orphanage doorstep uh, October 15th, 1973. And the... Nuns gave me a birthday and gave me a name. They're like, oh, she looks like she's about two or three days old. So the name they gave me was Kim Chi Thi Le. Meet Kim Eccles. There was already a plan to get me. Operation Baby Lift took babies and kids that already had homes already like in the works in the United States. And so I wasn't supposed to come to them until like a year old because that's how long all the paperwork was going to take. But since Operation Baby Lift happened so quickly and so soon, they got me early. So I came over here um, April 9th when I was six months old. Kim's parents, Jane and Jay Eccles, had enough love in their hearts for another child but they also wanted to make an impact on what they deemed an unjust situation. We have a family of four children who came about all rather uniquely. Our oldest daughter is also adopted. We were not actively protesting, but I thought it was a a horrible war. Uh, We probably should not have been there. We kind of wanted to do something to um, mitigate the whole situation and and taking a a baby from uh, Vietnam seemed like uh, uh, something we could do to mitigate within ourselves the effects of of that war. I grew up in a small town um, about 40 miles north of Seattle, uh, Lake Stevens, Washington. My dad was a firefighter in Seattle. Later, he became the mayor of Lake Stevens, which was embarrassing. Uh, My mom was a teacher's assistant. And then we had, um, I have an older brother, an older sister, and a little sister. My childhood was very happy, very normal. She was uh, so busy uh, growing up. She was, she made the rest of us look like we were standing still. In school, she was the cheerleader. Uh, In college, she was the newspaper editor. She was totally involved with everything. The rest of us had good lives, but Kim had an extraordinary life. After high school, Kim decided to leave one Washington for another. She left the state and came to D.C. After graduating college, the job search began. So I was just looking. I think I found the job on Monster or some sort of online online job place. And it didn't say a lot. It just said Department of Defense Event Planner. It had nothing else. I was like, oh, I'll just put in for that. And I did that. And a year and a half later or so, I was contacted to come in. So that's how that happened. It was sort of out of the blue. The Department of Defense position that Kim applied for was with the very same agency that helped bring her to America. That would be us, the Defense Intelligence Agency. But Kim wasn't aware of DIA's efforts in Operation Baby Lift. She never made the connection. Then, on her first day of work at the agency, when she was on a tour of the DIA Museum with historian Paul Isaacson, she had a serendipitous encounter. So, President Gerald Ford, U.S. President, authorized what's called Operation Baby Lift. I had no idea. I had none. I knew that there were babies and people that had died on the plane, but I didn't know any of the stories. So when I came here, actually, it was Paul that gave us a tour, and he said, this is the Patriots Memorial, and we have lost five colleagues during Operation Baby Lift. Uh, it went on to save thousands and thousands of people's lives, Operation Baby Lift. So I encourage you to do some more and I was like, on that. I was a part of that. So I think I said to the person next to me, like, hey, I was a part of that, and Paul heard. I'm sure that you figured we would bring Paul back to recount his version of the story. 
All right, Paul, what's your recollection of this moment of awareness that Kim had? And she referenced the Patriots Memorial. Can you tell us about that? So the Patriots Memorial is one stop on our museum tour. And it is, uh, it is the one place in our museum where we honor those who have given their lives in service to this agency and to our country. And you see Kim talking to the person next to her about Operation Babylift. What did you hear her say? I was a part of that operation. And that was just mind blowing because for me, it was something I had just, you know, studied from, from stories, from others, from books. I'd never met anybody who was a part of this. Do I have a, a, a former baby lift baby standing right in front of me and joining this agency today? And of course you spoke with her after the tour. What did she say to you? Well, she was up to date on the baby lift history in terms of her being a part of that. Obviously, you know, her parents had talked to her. She, she was well aware of, of what was involved with baby lift, but she had no idea that she was now that very week joining the agency that had been at the center of this operation that had brought her to America. Kim's been at DIA for a number of years. And in that time, you've gotten to know her. How do you think she's processed this? I think for her, it has brought more meaning to her work. I think it's it's been a, a very, very personal example of what we do. And I think it has really brought home for her how important our work is. You know, and, and at one point we approached her to uh, ask her if she had any thoughts to share for a new memorial um, art wall we have in the museum. And she, you know, she shared with me many thoughts. And out of that, we put a quote on the wall from Kim. And the quote is, so others might live. The most important part of the, of this whole thing, obviously, isn't me. It's the people that passed away and that gave their lives to help a humanitarian effort. Someone else was giving of their time and their energy and ultimately their lives to help other kids from another country have a chance to do great things too. So that's kind of cool. And then it's nice you know, every time I walk by the Patriots Memorial, I do take a minute to just look at their names and, you know, try to, you know, just think about them so that they keep, you know, living on in someone's memory. I'm searching for my past, for my own identity. They said what's best for the child, don't abandon me. Our last guest came to this country almost 50 years ago, too. Music is how he expresses the emotions of being an Operation Babylift adoptee. I'm not a child, you don't have to speak to me. I'm Jared Rayberg, and I'm also known as Vu Tianan from my orphanage in Saigon, Vietnam. I was adopted in 1975. Are you listening to me? Uh, I arrived in Georgia at Fort Benning and I was nine months old. To me. And my life began in America. Are you listening to me? Jared, before we get to your music, you told me earlier that it wasn't until you were 25 before you really started to make a personal connection to Operation Babylift. Can you share that story? You know, I think my journey as an adoptee began in Baltimore in the year 2000 when I attended a reunion uh, with other adoptees from around the country who came during Operation Babylift. And it was a chance to kind of share stories and and kind of share our, our, our similarities and a lot of our struggles, a lot of our challenges. And that was the beginning of, of my journey. Uh, as the uh, identifying as not just an, an American, but a Vietnamese adoptee as well. And that's when you began to express yourself through music. 
Would you tell us about that? I found myself using the guitar to create you know, songs and stories that were going through my head and the thoughts that I had. The story of my past, where I was born, it's just a guess. The truth is based upon what I was told. Songs I wanted to sing to my grandparents, songs I wanted to sing to my parents. Life gets busy, you forget. There are questions without answers that follow me. Songs I wanted to sing to birth relatives I've never met. My work has just begun. A song I wanted to sing to other adoptees to let them know everything's going to be okay. I believe I'll be chasing dragon flies. Have you seen the road I'm traveling on? Jared, I know that you've traveled around the country performing at camps for children that you have a shared experience with. You have a song about that called Someone Like Me. Would you tell us about that song? I love that song. I loved writing that song because it was a chance to directly sing to the kids at summer camp. I need this connection much more than I thought I would. Feels good to belong somewhere I'm often misunderstood. Let them know that I'm a lot like them. It makes a difference to know you're out there. And they're a lot like me, and uh, I understand what they're going through. So many stories to share. I know the struggles. I know the weight that they're carrying. I know the fears. Jared, I listened to a lot of your music preparing for our conversation, and I think Waking Up American might be your most powerful song. What was the inspiration for that one? It started with a vision of, of a young child laying on the floor, watching television and, and seeing clips of the Vietnam War. I see you on my TV. And the first line is, I see you on my TV, yeah. rushing home from work on crowded streets. And one of those people could be my relatives. And mouth to feed. And one of them could be my birth parents. And the child is wondering what happened to his birth family. Without you, I'm living in America with a brand new name. I woke up one day and I was an American. I'm waking up American on a brand new day and I'm still the same. My country tears something Sweet land of liberty And for thee I say If you'd like to learn more about Operation Babylift, you can check out our video series, The Historians, on DIA.mil. And please, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to DIA Connections. As always, thanks for listening. For thee I say